South Africa is facing two deadly epidemics, a relentless tidal wave of gender-based violence. We are, as a country, in crisis. Violence against women and children and the LGBTIQ+, it's a crisis. And now, the tsunami of COVID-19. Will this be the turning point for a country already in crisis? COVID has really taught us to see that the way forward is no longer um, what we used to do before. We the people in the townships, we the people in the rural area, and we the people as South Africans, we have a right to protection. It is the day before the start of South Africa's lockdown. I am on my way to Caledon in the Western Cape. It is a small rural farming town nestled in the Overberg Mountains. On the outskirts are a patchwork of RDP housing and about 20 informal settlements comprising around 5,000 residents. Most are without even the most basic services. Already isolated, every day they face health and safety risks, not only during a pandemic. Terms like social distancing, self-isolation, even sanitation are luxuries they cannot afford. Housing is a very big shortage here. They don't have running water in rim. The sharing of the toilets, most of the toilets are broken down, so they use the bucket system, but it's not the bucket system where they throw the human waste away. It just gets thrown out wherever. Tanya Bippert is a community activist and a member of One Billion Rising, a global movement established to respond to the worldwide scourge of gender-based violence and crimes against children. South Africa has five times higher the global average of femicide and the highest incident of rape in the world. Gender-based violence is also rife in rural areas. It is rife, but it never reaches the media. And that's what I've been trying to do, is to get the spotlight more in the rural areas. Um, once an issue happens here, we don't have a Tutuzela center, we don't have um, a trauma counseling centers, we don't have safe houses. But the lockdown has forced activists to put gender-based violence on the back burner for now. Food security is as crucial as safety, particularly with the closure of school feeding programs that provided impoverished children with a single daily source of nutrients. We've got about 200 kids, and when holiday times come, it's 300 plus. Since the start of the lockdown, community leaders say that in the absence of a coherent disaster management strategy, they have had to make their own plans to protect the most vulnerable, the elderly and children. We were never part of the decision making, but ultimately on the ground, we are now the ones that are, you know, uh, taking from here and there and supporting each other. Lucinda Evans is the founder of Pilisa Abafazi Betu, an emergency shelter for abused women. She's also the South African coordinator of One Billion Rising. We've got coordinators and they are the local heroes in this community. They are the people that are doing the social spacing and within 45 minutes they feed over 350 children. Farida Raycliffe is a gender rights activist in Delft on the Cape Flats. Along with Mitchell's Plain, it has the highest number of domestic abuse and gender-based violence cases in the province. During the lockdown, she has also had to switch her role to that of health worker and food provider. Frustration grows. It, it, it can turn into to violence because now we, there's nothing to eat. The kids are hungry, they're crying, daddy, mommy don't have it. Now they start acting out on each other because the one is blaming the other one. You know, so that's why our organization tried to fill that gap by securing, you know, to ensure food security. And educating the vulnerable, particularly the children, about keeping safe during the pandemic is a top priority. They share the lollipop. So as soon as there's a lollipop, the one gives two sucks of hands to the friend. Um, all their little hands are in one packet of chips. And then as well, the, the food. Um, they're not getting the nutrients, the boosters they need. So I'm actually very scared for them, yes. 
Children in South Africa might be particularly susceptible to infection given their already compromised immune systems from HIV AIDS, malnutrition and highly contagious poverty-related diseases like TB. These kids are already born with issues. Um, it's either the lungs, um, hearts, any, they've got medical issues already. Informal settlements on the fringes of rural towns are not the only communities at risk. Impoverished and congested settlements in the city are even more susceptible, like Sophia Town, an informal settlement in Kalesrafia, 35 kilometers from Cape Town. The residents have been living there since 1999, left in the cold, literally, and now locked down without adequate support. So Fire Town is a place where there's one tap, no electricity. Uh, a lot of the time it's a legal uh, um, connection. Um, law enforcement would come and they would cut the electricity. So in winter it's, it's a big crisis because these people's clothing are raining wet. The space that they occupy is already so small. COVID-19 has magnified the vast socio-economic gaps that have underpinned South African society for decades. So Sophia Town will be overlooked. I'm the only person that came here um, to give them soap and, and some information sheets. And fears of the catastrophic consequences of the virus are accompanied by the realization that the lockdown has aggravated the triggers that contribute to violence against women and children, not only globally, but in South Africa in particular. And I want to say women, of Cape Town and the broader South Africa. If this government fails to protect us, we will take them to the Concord and make sure that we are protected. People are on lockdown, people are hopefully in their homes. And then where do you run to? How do you alert people? Um, you know, perpetrators are known to take your mobile phone. In the first week of lockdown, 2,300 complaints of abuse were registered with the police and through the Gender-Based Violence Command Centre. Women-led community organisations say this is 37% higher than the weekly average in 2019, and that number is growing. What portion of that calls was just for counselling? What portion of that calls was the referrals through to a shelter? Um, you know, those kinds of breakdowns, we don't have that. And those are the things that COVID has exposed. Three weeks into South Africa's COVID lockdown and an agonizing decision must be made whether to violate the lockdown laws and risk arrest or endure another night of violation at the hands of an abusive partner. For this woman, it was a choice between life and death. He was smacking me around because he, so he still had my son in his hand and then he pushed me on the floor. Well, I was scared because I've never experienced something like that. So at that time, you don't know what to expect. This uh, mother was with us um, at the shelter previously in 2017 and um, I mean she broke the she violated the, the lockdown laws and got into a taxi to get through to us and I mean we were all flabbergasted when she was she walked in at St Anne's in quite a state. While life as we know it is on hold during the lockdown reports of gender-based violence have spiked. GBV is now the shadow pandemic that has been running a parallel and alongside COVID-19. By the 22nd of April, the command centre had received 12,702 calls ranging from reports of domestic abuse to desperate pleas for food. The South African government itself has done, you know, um, really good and taken good measures in addressing, you know, and, and trying to address the prevention of, of COVID-19 during the lockdown period. However, I don't think they've considered the complete and entirety of the gendered impact of this illness. The issue of shelters is, is crucial because uh, some of the shelters are not fully equipped or they've run out of resources, to be quite frank. 
and survivors of gender-based violence often don't know how to access support services. So we have um, information on COVID providers everywhere. Should we not think about adding a GBV additional advertisement that would be able to reach all women in this country? <laughs> Caitlin is a seasoned survivor of abuse. Her parents were alcoholics and she was removed from her family when she was a child. I grew up with foster people who adopted me at a young age. They were treating us unfairly. As a child growing up, I never received that love, not, not that support, nothing. I had to be the mother, the father, the brother to myself. When I was 15 and I ended up on the street. I lived there on the street for three years and the things that you see that you are being exposed to, you see how they, the, the young ladies, even young as teenagers as well, being beaten by their boyfriends, being put on the street to go and sell their bodies, people getting raped next to you. But Caitlin also had an unfailing belief in herself. For me as a person, I grew up with respecting myself and my yes is my yes and my no is my no. It was when she said no to her partner's demands for sex that he repeatedly turned violent. The final straw was during lockdown. She had to go to town and arrived home late because there were no taxis. Because my son was sick, so I went to buy medicine, whatever, I sorted him out now. And then later on, he wanted to have sex with me. And then I just said, no, I don't want to. And that's where he got angry. So then he started to hit me now. And then he said, I must go out. Put me out in the middle of the night. And then I just packed my bags and I took my children. But as I walked, it was still very early and I was thinking about my son who was having a bed, who was coughing and everything. So I just turned back. So I went back home to him and then asked him to let us in. It all happened in front of the five-year-old daughter as well. And it's also not the first time. At daylight, Caitlin fled to St Anne's shelter in Woodstock and we uh, then referred her, so they are safe. Joy Langer is the head of St Anne's Shelter for Abused Women in Woodstock and the Women's Shelter Movement in the Western Cape. She says that the cases of domestic abuse she has dealt with since lockdown have increased, not only in number, but intensity. That comes from the fact that there's this isolation, complete isolation within the home. And so um, the need to get out is is even greater because there's no one that can hear and come and support. In a single day, seven young mothers were referred to the Iharta Shelter for Abused Women in Athlone. What is tragic for me is we are seeing many younger women with young children who are coming through. Um, I, I fear for the future. South Africa's domestic violence shelters are reaching maximum capacity and will be unable to take in new survivors due to the lockdown social distancing and the threat of infection. When women need our help, we can't necessarily bring them into the shelter if they've not been screened for COVID. But where do we send them when every other shelter is full? What happens with a woman that now finds herself destitute as a result of the COVID lockdown, but it's also related to gender-based violence? Where does she go to with her children in this time when everything is literally locked. Please make more space available. We are all as the women's shelters, we are jam-packed. Would provincial or national government make one of the hotels available? We're just asking for practical spaces where we could get more beds in, more chairs in, um, and with social distancing, of course, space is a huge challenge for us right now. We've also had to keep our, um, the current women and children that were in the shelter safe adhering to the health protocols in terms of the sanitizers, the gloves and, you know, all of those things that the shelters also needed to have. And that, um, not all shelters can afford that. Women's shelters are only partially funded by the Department of Social Development. But working with the Western Cape government, the women's shelter movement has identified four shelters that can serve as quarantine centres 
for survivors of domestic violence who are infected with the virus. The implementation um, boils down to the provinces. And so, for example, in our province, I can say, because I've been part of it, that we've actually done very well under the circumstances, um, seeing that it was all an 11th hour process. Um, and for example, the exco of the shelter movement, they check in with the province every day. The movement is also in constant contact with the Department of Social Development's National Command Centre, which refers cases to it. I don't know what happens in other provinces, but for now, it is adequate as the time goes along. And everything is directed with what the president has put in place to protect us and what the Department of Health. We have open lines and all the managers are able to speak on a daily basis directly to the VEP services, directly make the, the proposals and directly asking the questions and accommodate our needs and I think and I must and I must reiterate it's been working fantastic. Caitlin is safe for now. I would like to just to get on my feet. There was a time when I wanted to give my children up for adoption. Everything just it was just too much. They are the reason why I'm loving and going on. They give me that, that strength that hope. In March this year, South Africa commemorated International Women's Day and Human Rights Day. And there will be another But for many South Africans, it was a march of mourning. In addition to the thousands of women and children murdered every year in South Africa, since January, there have been over 20 murders, mainly in the Western Cape. We want justice! Bring back this death penalty! Most horrifying of all, six children murdered, five of them sexually violated and butchered by men on parole who had raped and murdered before. How many of our communities lost loved ones? The perpetrators were paroled people that were paroled because they murdered and they raped. They came back to our communities to rape and murder our children again. Government promised to act. Looking closely at our parole system, our rehabilitation programs, failures in our systems, including the monitoring of, of these programs. In September 2019, tens of thousands of South Africans had marched on Parliament. Their demands included tougher parole conditions and no bail for sex offenders, improved victim support at police stations, upgrading sexual offences courts and increasing the number of Tutuzela centres, particularly in remote rural areas. Tutuzela centres are one-stop facilities enabling rape and sexual abuse survivors to access services from medical to investigative. They are not enough, we agree, and uh, I've been in protest with the opening of the sexual offences court last week. And there is an outcry, especially in the rural areas because the location of our units is at a distance and it also impacts on the turnaround time from those specialized you know, units to access those police stations. There is also a backlog in the testing of DNA samples in rape and murder cases that have delayed court proceedings for years, enabling the alleged perpetrators to remain on the streets, often in close proximity to victims and their families. There's a 12-year-old little girl. Um, she was actually raped by two suspects. Um, we've got the 24-year-old male um, disabled boy that was also raped. Um, they're still trying to find out they've got it. they think he was out on parole, that actually the suspect that attacked him. What about Jesse Hess? What about the fact 
that the case once again has been postponed because all the evidence or the DNA is not there. How many of that 1.6 million billion is going to be invested to get forensic doctors to get better resources in terms of DNA? Why do we have to wait so long for DNA? With the COVID-19 lockdown, everything came to a halt. Due to start in April this year, the trial of the man who allegedly raped and murdered five-year-old Tasna van Veik has been postponed to July. And even with the long-awaited opening of a sexual offences court in Bredasdorp this year, there is an increasing backlog of cases in rural areas. We've got a little boy of 13 that was raped last year, November here. Um, and then we've got a whole lot of cases that are ongoing that, that have just not reached the regional court yet, um, especially when the perpetrators are underage. In the last decade, initiatives to form national coalitions against gender-based violence have floundered. After a summit in September 2019 and during his State of the Nation speech, President Ramaphosa announced that a 1.6 million rand gender-based violence and femicide fund would be established. There was a draft national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide that was introduced for public comment in August, September last year. Yes. And my understanding is that on the 11th of March this year, um, government approved that plan. And part of that plan includes the, the GBV fund. But the fund has not yet been activated. They need to establish the permanent council that is going to oversee the implementation of the national strategic plan. And parallel to that process, it, that includes the setting up or the finalization of the GBV fund. We know nothing. I mean, those of us that are working in the trenches, the conversation, of course, didn't reach uh, my ears and I, many of the other activists that are there. So, yeah, no, we, we don't know about it. It is a very important that we ensure that there are certain funds that are also dealing with the impact of COVID during the lockdown period and, and thereafter, um, specifically on of survivors and victims of GBV. The first reported case of rape during the lockdown was at a controversial shelter erected for the homeless in Strandfontein that has now been closed. A 75-year-old grandmother raped and strangled, a 19-year-old, a 6-year-old, and scores more that are not reaching the media. Months of restrictions have taken their toll on the nation, especially the poor. Hunger and anger are mounting, and winter is approaching. People are worried about what they'll eat next and what their children are gonna eat. Others are worried about where they'll get electricity and water from. And then others are worried about their lives, whether they'll be safe, whether they'll be, they're going to be violated. I'm calling on you, Mr. President. I'm calling on you to release the blockages to ensure that the townships will get what is needed so that those women that is stuck with a potential abuser in their home and the child that is hungry, living in a two-room flat or in a shack with maybe eight to ten people would be able to eat. Access for older persons, the frail, and the disabled. I am not asking you for the plan, I'm asking you for the action. But the nation is also united in crisis. BC, or before COVID-19, seems a long time ago. There is hope that AD, after the disaster, we will succeed in turning the tide. COVID has forced us to realize what the rainbow nation, the rainbow country, the South Africa, we would like to continue with, with our attitude, with our loving action, without reaching out to each other.